All right, so welcome to everybody. It's, it's truly a distinct pleasure uh, to be introducing Dr. Eric Fry, who I'm very fond of. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's one, one, one individual that I met at Johns Hopkins University in my years that I was there that I've always looked up to uh, scientifically. He's, he's, he's a fantastic scientist. And on a human level, he's just uh, full of integrity. So it's always been a pleasure to know him uh, uh, over the years. He, um, he, uh, he's uh, presently the chief operating officer and the co-founder of Radio Pharmaceutical Imaging and the Symmetry, uh, also known as RAPID. And he is a professor at Johns Hopkins University in the division of radiological physics at the Department of Radiology. A, a real expert in task-based image quality evaluation, dual isotope imaging, and photon counting X-ray CT. Uh, you know, he's 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 very well recognized in the field. Was awarded the prestigious Hoffman Award at the Physics Instrumentation Data Sciences Council of the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. His work has been translational. One area where I was quite inspired, I, I you know, as I learned years ago, his his work in SPECT imaging. Um, and doing, uh, you know, very accurate model-based image reconstruction ended up being translated and was taken up by industry. Um, so that was quite uh, inspiring to me when, when I was learning about it over the years, how, you know, the work that we do as physicists can uh, impact uh, uh, patient care, essentially. And so, and recently he's been working in the area of quantitative reconstruction for radio pharmaceutical therapy dosimetry, which I'm sure we're going to be hearing about um, and again, RAPID was funded or founded by him in 2016 in conjunction with Michael Galli and George Scores uh, to commercialize techno technology that they had developed at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be hearing about some of these things and you know, with the talk here today, especially focusing on alpha emitting radio, radio pharmaceuticals. Eric. Hi, thanks. Thanks, Armin, for the, those kind words. Um, I first of all, I'm supposed to tell you that the Hopkins makes me tell you that I get money for some of the software that, that um, Armin mentioned, and I'm a owner of Rapid, and I have to fill out lots of paperwork because of that. Um, so what I'm mostly going to talk today is about the quantitative spect of alpha emitters, but to try to put that in context, I'll talk a little bit about why radio pharmaceutical therapy for cancer, um, what is dosimetry, and uh, that's the reason that we do this quantitative spect. We want to do dosimetry. Um, why we want to do it with alpha emitters, why I want to use radio pharmaceuticals that have um, alpha emitters uh, attached to them for therapy. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to give you a demonstration that will kind of tie the quantitative imaging into the dosimetry. Um, so why uh, pharmaceutical th radio pharmaceutical therapy? So there's been a lot of um, progress in therapies for cancer, uh, but metastatic cancer remain uh, you know, a, a sig significant cause of mortality, uh, for especially for people that are, that are uh, diagnosed in the late stage that have metastatic disease, the five-year rate, the five -year survival rates are pretty dismal, especially for um, certain kinds of, of cancers. Um, rate of pharmaceutical therapy is, is, uh, has a number of advantages that, have, uh, that may be applicable to metastatic cancer. It, it targets the tumor cells. And unlike uh, chemo, uh, chemotherapy or biologicals, it, the, the, um, the radiation can actually kill cells. Uh, and so there aren't the kind of resistance mechanisms that there can be from some of those other kind of um, agents. Um, why, why do we want to do dosimetry? And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but the dosimetry means that you want to measure the, that you want to dose to give doses to the patient based on how much energy is de deposited by those radio pharmaceuticals in either norm normal tissues or preferably normal tissues or tumors, if you can do both of those. Um, in order to do that, in order to know how much energy is deposited, we'd have to know how much of the radionuclide is present as a function of time, and we can do that with quantitative imaging. Um, and then we'd like to use what we know about the radiobiology to, um, to try to predict, use the, the, the absorbed dose, those physical quantities, to predict what's going to happen to the tumors. I won't talk about any of that today. That's more of the, the expertise of, of my partners. Um, I think there, there's kind of a three factors that reasons that radio pharmaceutical therapy is, is um, kind of important now, um, especially alpha emitters. There, there have been in the past, there hasn't been easy availability of, of um, alpha particle um, emitting radionuclides, so it's been hard to make commercial products. 
um, for a number of reasons that that's kind of changed. Um, there's a, also a large number of targeting molecules. The, the drug companies have been interested in targeting cancer and they've developed biologicals and things like that. Um, but as a result of that, they have these targeting molecules that they're now looking for other applications for. Um, and then there are chelators that are, uh, you know, the radiochemists have learned more about how to attach radionuclides to target molecules. And especially that's true for uh, things like, like alpha particle emitters. Um, so why alpha emitters? The, the basic answer is that alpha particle emitters have very high linear energy transfer. They, they deposit all their energy over a very small scale. You know, if you look at the scale, this is the, the different um, photons that are, I mean, the different alpha particles that are emitted by the different daughters of actinium-225. And you can see that they're all deposited in a very short range of, of where the decay is. Um, and, and that means, several means, that short range means that they do less damage to surrounding tissues. So they, they are target pretty much what they, you know, where the targeting molecule goes to. Um, second of all, because of that high linear energy transfer, they tend to be very lethal. There are many tracks, you know, in a single nearby atom um, and much more likely to kill it than, than one decay, for example, of, of a beta emitter. Um, and so they may be especially appropriate for metastatic disease where you can get the targeting molecules close to the, the cells that are causing the, you know, the cancerous cells. And um, so there's a lot of interest for that reason. Um, so what our real goal is, is to use um, dosimetry for treatment planning. And in a lot of the current therapies, radiopharmaceutical therapies are treated as, as radioactive chemotherapy. Therapy. So they're dosed by things like body surface area or patient, patient mass. Um, and that's partly because there haven't been, it's hard to say. It's because <laughs> for a lot of reasons they haven't been used. But I think there's a, a consensus developing and certainly um, from the physics community that really dosing is what the, dosing based on on the physical parameter the, the absorbed dose to the tissues makes a lot more sense than than based on weight and things like that and that's because different patients can have different anatomies they have different sized organs they have different um, even if they have the same body mass or body surface area they they have different uh, different tumors and different even normal organs will have different um, uptakes and so the amount of the radio the, the therapeutic that's present in an organ or a tumor as a function of time will be different for different patients. Um, and since with the radionuclides, we have the possibility to image them, then we have the possibility to see where they are and measure their biokinetics and then um, determine how many decays happen in the, in the normal organs and the tumors. Um, and from that, we can then estimate the, the dose that's deposited. Um, the dose is related to the number of decays. So what we need to do is uh, measure, if we measure the activity in, in some organ or tumor as a function of time, that's the time activity curve. And normally we don't sample that very finely because every point we want to measure the activity, we have to image them. So we typically measure that, you know, from somewhere from three, well, sometimes one to uh, five or seven time points. Um, and that gives us a curve. And what we need to do is we need to integrate that. The area under that curve is called, called the time integrated activity. Um, and that is, related to, it's proportional to the number of, um, of disintegration. So activity is disintegrations per second and the interval over time is, is basically just the number of disintegrations. And so you can imagine how you can calculate those from that because if you know the energy in a disintegration, then you can calculate you know, the product of the number of disintegrations times energy, energy per disintegration gives you the energy that's deposited. Um, Oftentimes for dosing point of view, we're interested in, in the time integrated activity coefficient. Um, it used to be called the resonance time. And time activity integrated activity coefficient is just how much uh, activity is there divided by how much um, we, gave, we gave the patient when we measured this activity curve. Um, and then if we wanted to achieve some, uh, some dose um, later, we could use the, the time integrated activity coefficient and, and to, cal to uh, calculate how much activity we needed to get um, some desired dose. Um, so how do we measure that with imaging? As I mentioned, we don't measure the time activity curve at a, it, it continuously, but we measure it at a finite number of time points. I um, mean, so typically what you do is you'll, in, you'll fit that with some kind of curve. Um, and since we're pr primarily interested in the area of it, the shape, for example, at early time points is less important than the, than the at later time points. So if there's an uptake phase or something like that, we don't have to sample really finely to try to get that, you know, as opposed to what you would want to do in, in for example, diagnostic um, PET imaging. Um, one way to do that, and the, the radio um, nuclides that are often used in therapy um, don't emit uh, positrons, and so you have to image them with SPECT. And so if you do a SPECT CT uh, at each of those time points, 
um, then you can use quantitative spec reconstruction methods that I'll talk about in a few minutes to reconstruct um, activity distributions. You can then quantify the activity distributions in some region of interest, an organ or a tumor, um, plot those, fit those with the curve, integrate it to get the resonance time or the time integrated activity coefficient. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes, please go uh, ahead. So you, you said uh, that, that later times are more important. Is that because you have to integrate to infinity? Is that the reason? Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, you'd like to, um, you know, for biological, the, 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 one of the biological things you want to take into account, biological effects, radiation biology is the dose rate. And so um, if, you, if you incorporate those, then the later time points aren't maybe as important. But, you know, the, the, the uptake phase is just adds very little to the total number of decays. Right. So errors in there aren't as important as, you know, knowing some of the later. Okay. Thank you. So how do we turn that into dosimetry? Um, one way to do that is, is called organ dosimetry and the MERD committee, the Medical Internal Radiation Dosimetry Committee is, has come up with a, a formalism for doing that. Um, it was originally designed for diagnostic uh, radionuclides. It still has some, I'll mention some limitations in a minute, but um, just for the purposes of this talk, since that's not what I'm focusing on and, and that's what I'm gonna demonstrate later, let me just a little bit of background on, on how that works. Um, so the basic idea is we measure the the uh, um, time integrated activities in a bunch of organs, so it's the source organs. Um, and the, the, the source organs we would choose would be the ones with their, where there happens to be more uptake. So for often for, a, for an antibody, they're met metabolized in liver, so we would uh, use the liver. And then maybe if it's a peptide, they're metabolized in the kidney, so we would choose the kidney in a source organ. And we measure the activity in a bunch of source organs. Um, and then we want to calculate the dose from that. And there's a, uh, this relationship uses the, the, um, the S values. And the S value is basically the fraction of the, uh, the, the absorbed dose um, to some target organ per uh, time integrated activity of the source. So per disintegration, it's, the, it's kind of the energy that's absorbed by some target organ um, per disintegration of the, um, some source organ. And so that's why it has this, uh, this um, notation saying that this is the S value from some source to some target organ. And so for some target organ, we want to sum up over all the source organs. Um, and that's especially necessary if you have uh, photons or if you have small structures and the, the um, radiations, the photon, the, the electrons or the photons um, can be emitted in one organ and deposit energy in another organ. Um, so the, the S values are typically the reason that this is often used is those S values are pre-calculated for standard phantom ge geometries. Uh, and the geometry that's been used for a long time is this, this so-called Christie Eckerman phantom. Um, and it was generated using um, simple shapes that are, you know, second order shapes. Uh, and the reason for that is that the Monte Carlo simulations that were then used to calculate those S values or um, the, the fraction of the energy that's deposited in some other organ from a decay in this organ really couldn't handle voxelized. They weren't efficient, efficient enough to handle voxelized phantoms. Um, more recently, the ICRP has come out with a, a series of phantoms and um, then some uh, um, data that you need to calculate S values that are based on voxelized standard phantoms. Um, and so the organ geometries are much, much more realistic for these kind of phantoms than they are shapes and geometries and much more realistic than for the Christie Ackerman data. Um, with, with organ mass correction, then I think especially for therapeutic radionuclides um, where most of the energy is deposited locally, then the, the um, standard phantom geometries um, can be useful for, for therapy. Um, if you're interested in the, the distribution inside uh, objects or you're interested in tumors, then, then these kind of dose entry methods are not as useful. And the primary advantage is they're much less computationally intensive. They basically are, can be done instantaneously as compared to um, other, some of the other 3D methods. So there are a number of challenges with doing dosimetry for alpha emitters. Um, and I think the principal challenge for probably any dosimetry is, is figuring out where the radionuclides are. Um, there are a number of things that make that especially hard for alpha emitters that they have complicated decay, decay, decay schemes. And I'll show you some of those in a minute. Um, they emit multiple gamma rays. They're not nice and simple like uh, something like technetium or even things like indium where there's a finite number of gamma rays that have a relatively low energies. Um, for some of them, there's high energy photons. I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. And then the administered activities tend to be to be low, you know, even in the, the, uh, the amounts can be in the order of, um, you know, microcuries or, or tens of microcuries. Um, and so that can make the image, resulting images, you know, uh, relatively noisy. 
Um, there are a number of radionuclides that are important in targeted al alpha therapy, and that's partly um, because of availability and some of the physical properties. Um, the ones that I'm going to talk about are, are radium-223, um, thorium-227 that decays into radium-223, um, lead-212, and I'm not going to talk about actinium-225, but that's another one. And there's some others, um, astatine and bismuth um, and, and so on that are uh, used, but these are the ones that at Rapid we've had more experience with, and so those, that's what I'll talk about. Um, just a little bit of view of the of the um, the case schemes to show you some of the complexity. Um, you can see that the ra um, radium decays until it gets to something stable. It goes through a number of daughters, uh, and some of those are pretty quick. And so you can probably assume that the that the radon, for example, is is decays very similar to where the the um, radium decays. Um, but some of those are longer. So um, 36 minutes is the half life from lead into into um, bismuth to 11. So um, and two minutes from um, bismuth um, to its daughter. So you may need to take that into account. So ideally, you'd like to be able to, to uh, predict where the lead is. And, and you can maybe do that by knowing the, you know, how the biochemically what lead does tends to be carried in the blood. Uh, with bismuth, you tend to know that it, it accumulates in kidneys. Or you can try to image that. Image that. Um, this shows some of the, 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 the um, difficulty with imaging. These are the, the um, imageable photons and my criterion for that is they had energies greater than 50 kV and abundance is um, more than 10 percent. Um, you can see that there's you know high energy photons that are going to cause cross uh, down scatter problems. There's some other low abundance ones even though that I, I didn't show even those can go through the collimator and and cause problems. Um, but you can see the abundances are not that high um, since the activities are low that's going to make it more challenging. Um, there is some possibility. We actually haven't worked on it too much, but you know, there's a bismuth photon that you can maybe image that would tell you where the, the bismuth decayed, which would be nice to know. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that for some of these other radium nuclides. The second one, lead 212, is a little bit simpler. Um, it's not actually an alpha emitter itself, but it decays by beta emission to bismuth 212. And so you can kind of think about it as being a, an internal um, generator for um, bismuth 212. Um, the bismuth decays by two paths, one of which gives an alpha. Um, and then the, probably the biggest challenge is that the, the decay of this thallium-208 the, the gives rise to two very high energy photons that are, that are high abundance and they're way too high energy to inter image with kind of conventional gamma cameras. And they're actually even, the energies are such so high that it really is hard to collimate them. Um, and they, they kind of go streaming, streaming through the collimator and, and um, cause all sorts of problems with trying to do the quantitative imaging. The final one that I'll talk about is the thorium radium uh, combination. And, and this one, it really shows the importance of doing that dual isotope imaging. The, the thorium decays with an 18 day half-life to radium that has an 11 day half-life. And so that's plenty of time for the thorium, for the radium to dis redistribute. Um, radium tends to be accumulated in the bones. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first alpha emitting radio pharmaceutical is radium 223 chloride um, that is used for uh, treating metastatic um, um, bone metastases and prostate cancer. Um, both those emit alpha, alpha particles. Uh, one of the nice things is if you look at the, the energies of the photons, there's, a, there's some separate photons that you could hope to image the, the thorium and, and radium separately. And so I'll show you some data on that um, later where we've um, been able to do that. Um, so the goals, our goals in developing these quantitative methods have been to develop reconstruction methods that can give us the activity distribution inside the, the patient. I mean, in order to do that, we're going to have to correct for all these factors, the attenuation scatter, um, the downscatter from those high energy photons into the energy windows we're acquiring, um, and the fact that the, some of the photons are, don't just go through the holes, but they go through the septal walls and, and they scatter off the septal walls and contribute to the image. Um, and then finally, we'd like to be able to act to do distribution for uh, you know all the daughters. Ideally, Not, probably won't isn't achievable. But so I'm going to quickly talk about some of the image degrading factors and what they do and and why you need to model them. Um, so ideally, if you had a source inside a, a patient and you had a collimator that only let the per perpendicular photons go through and none of the photons interacted in the patient, then what we'd get of a, the image that we'd get of a, of a source would be a, a point source would be a delta function. Um, and if we did that and we rotated the camera around the patient, acquired the projections at a bunch of views, then we could get fil use filter back projection and, and reconstruct um, pretty accurately and quantitatively the, the, um, the activity inside, activity distribution inside the patient. 
Um, but unfortunately, some in in real in real situations, some of the photons are scattered and absorbed and don't ever leave the patient. And so that means even though if we had an ideal collimator, that, that we we would now um, get a still be a delta function, but it would be uh, attenuated delta function. And the amount of attenuation depends on how much tissue that the photons have to go through. So they would uh, um, the the amount of attenuation is depends on the projection view. And in terms of what that does to the images, this shows if you use a if you had a uniform object like this with two hot spots in it, imaged it with attenuation and reconstructed it, you get this um, spatially varying loss of, of quantitative accuracy. And that's something that's obviously not something we need to deal with. Um, a second effect is scatter. And scatter refers to the fact that uh, photons can scatter inside the body and be detected. Um, they can still make it through the collimator holes. Now the energies will be reduced. And so we can use energy discrimination to throw away some of them. Um, but the energy resolutions of, of gamma cameras, you know, in the order of 10% at 140 keV. So they're not um, able to eliminate many of the scattered photons. So for example, you can get a photon that's scattered through an angle of about 80, 80 degrees or so and still have it be collected in a kind of conventional gamma camera in, in an energy window uh, for technetium. In terms of that, what that does to the images, it, 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 uh, quanti qualitatively, it, it reduces the contrast. Um, quantitatively, you can see that, if, that this is the, the red line is a, a profile through that image for if we include scatter in, in the object, then you can see that this kind of spatially varying um, spurious counts that would uh, correct or spur, it would de degrade the, ac the accuracy of that um, active distribution estimate. Um, the, the third image degrading factor is the fact that collimators aren't perfect. Um, we accept in order to get a finite number of photons, we have to make the holes wide enough so that uh, you know the, a, a, a significant number can make it through. And when we do that, we no longer have um, ideal spatial resolution, but we get something that an image, if, even a, if we just image a point source, and, and we would get something that looked like a Gaussian. Um, in addition, especially for high energy photons, some of them, the, the collimator walls aren't perfect, and we can have photons that scatter off the walls and contribute, and photons that scatter off the, the pen penetrate right through the collimator um, and are still detected. And those have some impact on the images. I don't know, I think you can probably see this, but this shows with a, an iodine-131 point source that has 364 kV photons. Um, if we image it with an appropriate collimator, then the septal penetration is not too bad. But if we image it with a, um, a medium energy collimator that we get these artifacts, these star uh, patterns in the image. Um, and that's similar to what would happen if, for example, we're trying to image a 250 kV photon with a medium energy collimator, and now we have some two, um, uh, 500 kV photons that are now kind of streaming through the collimator and giving these um, artifacts. And these artifacts depend on on position, uh, the, you know, distance from the collimator, um, things like that. Um, let's see, I'll, let me skip that. Um, one of the key effects on quantitative accuracy of, of the spatial, of the collimator detector response is it gives rise to images that are blurred. Um, so if we had a phantom that looked like this and we in include those collimator detector response effects, we'll get a, a reconstructed image that looks like that. So now if we put some region of interest over a tumor that we're interested in or some organ, um, we'll get we'll, the, the number of, the amount of activity we estimate inside that region will be less than what was actually there. Um, and that's often known as partial volume effects. Um, and so that kind of limits, especially the ability to resolve really small objects and certainly to um, get much information about what's going on at the voxel level inside, inside of organs. Um, how can we do the reconstruction to correct for that? Um, we can use iterative reconstruction methods. There's been a lot of work on these originally for primarily for qualitative image quality improvements, but also it, it, they also work very well for quantitative improvements. Um, and the basic idea there is if we start out with some initial estimate and usually so it's not to bias the, the final estimate, we start out with a uniform um, object. Um, we then use an algorithm to calculate the, what the projection um, of that is. That we usually use an algorithm called a projector, and that projector will model the physical effects we'd like to model. You know, to get the, the full quantitative accuracy, we like to model the attenuation, the scatter, and the, the collimator detector response. We take those computer projections and we compare them to the measure projections. Uh, but because the measure projections are corrupted by Poisson noise, we want to do that in a statistical sense. And so the comparison is done using um, a cost function. And the algorithms to do the comparison are, are derived based on uh, the cost function, something like the, the likelihood function, the, the um, 
statistical likelihood is, is what's often used, although there's been some different ones. It has the advantage of being, um, if there is an unbiased estimator, then you know, the, the likelihood function would be the, the appropriate cost function. Um, once we do that, that comparison, we would update the estimate. That's typically done with the transpose of this projection operator, which is known as a back projector. On the back projector, again, has some model of the, it includes models of the, of the um, physical effects. Um, and that gives us a new estimate. And then we repeat this process for an, a number of iterations until typically a large number of iterations to get good quantitative accuracy. Um, let me just say a little bit about how we model some of those, the physical effects. Um, the, the, a number of years ago, we developed this uh, method called the effective source scatter estimation method. Uh, and the basic idea there is that in iterative reconstruction, what we need is if we know the activity distribution, we have to predict what's in the projection data. And so this is something that um, we derived that is, is um, relatively fast. We can calculate the scatter estimate um, quickly, but it still takes into account the fact that, that's, that the scatter, the, the um, shape of the scatter point spread function will be spatially varying, the shape and the amount of it and all that is spatially varying. And it basically starts out with two um, kernels that we, that we estimate using a Monte Carlo simulation that takes into account the radiation, you know, the radiation transport of the photons. Um, it uses a, a basically a Taylor series and uh, uh, of the exponential attenuation of those. And so that's what these kernels are the, the product. This is um, this kernel times that one to the zeroth power. This one is that kernel times that one to the first power. And that one's that one to the second power. Um, we convolve the activity distribution with each of those kernels and that gives us three images. Um, we then take the weighted combination and this, you know, kind of, you can see that that kind of comes from the Taylor series where they're weighted by the depth the distance to the surface. Um, and then they're multiplied by the, uh, the, the density, um, the density, which is, is proportional to the electron density. And so um, that gives us this effective source. We then take the projection of that effective source and that gives us the scatter estimate. Um, and this thing is, it's really, it's exact only for a uh, single scatter in, in a uniform attenuator. Um, and I'm actually surprised after 20, using it for 25 years, it still works for some of these other situations. I'll show you some results using it today. Um, the other one that's, that's kind of important to mention, I didn't mention attenuation correction. That's really pretty easy. And for lack of time, I'm not going to talk about that. But the other one that's important to take correct for is the, the collimator detect response. And the way that's typically implemented is to take our reconstruction matrix, um, rotate it so that it's, uh, the, the rows are parallel to the, the projection or the, the detector. Um, and when we do that, it turns out that the collimator detect response is spatially invariant in, in uh, those rows that, that are a, a given distance from the collimator. So if we take the appropriate collimator detect response for each of those distances and convolve it with that, um, that gives a pretty good approximation of, of how the collimator detect response affects the, um, the, the is mo you, you can model the image formation doing that. So to put that together for something complicated like LED 212, um, I, we developed something we call the multiple energy range method. Um, so we've acquired data in, I, I think it was, I forget, two energy windows for the LED 212. I should have probably put that up here. Um, but what we do is we, we model that process using that effective source and the, and the collimator detector response modeling in a bunch of different energy ranges. First, we, we do the primary and the scatter photon separately. Um, for the primary photons, we take this low energy range and this overlaps the, the one of the energy windows we used. We have a collimator detector response that we calculated for that range because the collimator detector responses are, are spatially varying. Um, we convolve it with that and we, we repeat that for all these primary photons. Um, and then that gives us the primary contribution to the projection image. For the scatter photons, we use uh, the effective source method. And when we do that, we use kernels that take the energy of the scattered photons as they're emitted, um, I'm sorry, the emitted energy of the photons, and that gives a distribution into each of um, the, that would, be, would have been incident on the collimator with each of these energies. So this first set of kernels will take the emitted photons and then give us the number of scatter that's um, incident on the collimator in the 50 to 91 keV range. The second one would be for this range and, and so on. Um, and we do that, in this case, we had to do that up to a very high energy because there's those high energy thallium 208 photons. Um, if we then implement this in a, in a forward projector, then we can use that in a reconstruction um, algorithm to uh, reconstruct the images. Um, and to evaluate that, I'm going to show you um, uh, the, the, an experiment. The first thing we did, we, since we calculate those kernels and the CDR collimator detector response functions with a Monte Carlo simulation, I'm going to show you a 
experiment we did to, to verify that. Um, and th we used a simple, a relatively simple object, a, a, a cylinder with a, a large sphere in it. Um, and that's because that we use that because it's kind of easy to model that in the, in the in, and get a good match between what you actually measured and what you, what you simulated. Um, ooh, let's see. Oh, sorry, went the wrong way. Um, and th so this shows an agreement from those four different projection views. They're all, we, we positioned the phantom so it was kind of separate. It was, um, I'm sorry, it was um, asymmetric so that we could get four different views from just uh, two different camera positions. I mean, you see, we get pretty good agreement for all of them except this one where we, we uh, the, the, that had to do with the phantom going through the, the photons going through the table. We didn't model, model the, the, the imaging bed in that. Um, so I think that gave us confidence to use those results of that simulation to go ahead and do the, um, generate the, the CDRs and the scatter kernels we need to do the quantitative reconstruction. Um, so we did the, then did a spec study using that, uh, using that same phantom. Um, these are the two energy windows that we imaged that we used in the acquisition. Um, we didn't try to, to uh, image the bismuth uh, 211 in these experiments. Uh, we reconstructed those with uh, the, a model based on that MER method I just showed you. Um, and we imaged both, please go out. We imaged um, all the, the uh, we reconstruct the images both separately and combined and I'll show you the results of that. Um, these are the reconstructed images. We, we didn't put any background activity and that's, um, I don't know, the, the lead 212 is kind of nasty and we didn't really like handling it. And um, our, as you'll see for a minute, our, real, our, our approach is mostly with the phantom studies to show that we can get a good accuracy for a simple object and then to use simulations to show that we can get a good accuracy for patients. So these show the reconstructions um, for the two different, um, well, this is a little bit simpler method. I, that I didn't talk about, but these are the two reconstructions from window, um, window one and window two using the MER method. Um, these are profiles through it um, compared to what the, what the truth is. Um, you can see that there's some, um, you, you know, we can't recover all the resolution and so there's going to be some partial volume effects. Um, but if you look at the accuracy we got with that from the, this, this energy window, the energy window one, we got 1%. It's probably lucky that we got that good, but uh, if you take both of them together, we got about um, uh, 4%. Um, and I think that, you know, that's kind of typical of what we've seen with other radionuclides. We can get for uh, uh, medium energy collimators, we can get um, five to 10% uh, kind of accuracies. Um, so let me now move to radium-223. Um, and we did a similar experiment to, to what I just showed you using phantoms and to validate the simulation. But let me just go show you, uh, this is a, a simulation to model to, to try to understand what it would look like in humans. Uh, so this is an activity, this is an activity distribution that we got from the literature. There's uh, some uptake in the, in the intestines, the, the, the red marrow and the cortical bones. Um, so we modeled that in a, in, in a phantom, the um, XCAT phantom from um, Ben Choi and, and Paul Steegers. Um, and this shows the simulated activity distributions at, at uh, four different uh, imaging time points. Um, and you can see that they're, they're quite noisy. The activity is, is kind of low. Uh, the, the number of counts is low, the activity is administered is low, and, and the, um, the, so the number of counts you get are low. Um, you can also see how it redistributes from, you know, from going from the small bowel to the colon as, as you go with time, and it, it's decaying as radionuclide um, decays. Um, if you reconstruct those and take uh, coronal slices, then this shows what you can get. Um, these are the iteration parameters. This is from that longest time point. So those are, those are really noisy images. And if you were gonna use those to try to di do some diagnostic task, it probably wouldn't work very well. But if you put regions of interest around them, and, and then in this case, we knew where the regions were. So that we kind of, this isn't necessarily reflective of what you get in a patient. But if this shows that if you did know the regions of interest, what you would get in terms of the accuracies. Um, and you can kind of see here, uh, you know, on the order of 10% accuracies for most of these things. And the precisions, we did that by studying uh, 50 different noise realizations. Um, and so this kind of gives some ballpark. And, and I think it shows that even for these low radio, um, low activity radionuclides that you can, uh, with the challenging imaging properties, um, you can get activity, organ activity estimates that are, uh, you know, useful for doing dose symmetry. Um, let me show you a little bit. This is a, another experiment, the th uh, thorium-227. I want to show you this as a prelude to doing the, the simultaneous uh, reconstruction. This is, we we took this phantom, we filled it with, um, we actually had a couple of the phantoms, we filled some of them with uh, 
uh, some of these compartments with radium so, and some with thorium. And we then, yeah, so this one was filled with radium. These were fixed, filled with thorium. So at time point zero, there was no, um, no thorium and um, no radium in, in, in any of these compartments, the, the first five, and there was no thorium in, in this compartment. Um, this shows the results for the, the accuracy for the, the NEMA, this, the, the, I'm sorry, the reconstruction at, the, at that zero time point. Um, you can see the image quality is not, not particularly great. These are just the reconstructions from the, the two different energy windows that we used. Uh, but if you, again, if you look at the accuracy, even for these, for the largest spheres anyway, that we get um, pretty good accuracy for the, for the thorium. Um, for small objects, those partial volume effects are, are dominating. Um, like we, we have some methods to do partial volume correction that, that could probably improve that some, but I think for this, this smallest sphere, which I forget what the size it is, it's order of, order of a centimeter, um, it's not the smallest sphere. It should probably showed that up here. Uh, yeah, the volume. So the volume of that was a, a one cc. Um, I think you're not going to get very good results for spheres. That's you know the, the the bottom two sides. I think this one we could probably get something that was more reasonable if we use partial volume corrections. Um, I mentioned about the dual isotope um, reconstruction, and so the way the, we we use the fact that the thorium decays in the radium to test how we, we could do it, do the, how well we could do the simultaneous radium and thorium reconstructions on a couple of different days. Um, and this shows how, you know, as you let things decay over time, the ratio of radium over thorium um, increases. So there's more radium in, in those uh, compartments that originally had all thorium. Um, how do we do the dual isotope uh, reconstruction? So if you think about it as a matrix inverse problem, um, what we do is we take the radium image and we stack that on top of the thorium image. Uh, and then in the, the matrix, the projection matrix, we just need to uh, model all the different things. We have to model the uh, projection from the radium activity distribution to the radium energy window, the projection from the thallium. So this is the crosstalk from thallium into the radium window. I mean, I'm sorry, from thorium into the radium window. Um, the, this is the, the um, direct, this is the thorium into its own window. And this is the radium into the, the crosstalk from radium into the thorium. Um, once we do that, then we use the iterative method that I just method mentioned, but instead of reconstructing one activity distribution, we could reconstruct two, and we project into the, the, the two energy windows that we have. Um, and we did that. You can see these are some reconstructed images. Um, this is from, I forget which time point. I didn't write that down. I apologize for that. Um, but you can see that we get some things that are um, pretty reasonable. I'm not sure. This looks like it's a little distorted here. I'm not really quite sure why that is. I don't think it, yeah, not sure why that is. Um, um, but if we then look at the, and your faces are obscuring. Yeah, uh, so down here, the, this shows the, the accuracy. So for radium, we got an error of, of 16%. And for thorium, we got an error of, of 8% at this particular um, time point. If we didn't take into account the, the um, crosstalk from radium into the thorium, then we got uh, quite a mu much larger error in the, in the thorium. Um, let's see, so how am I doing for time going? Just about right. Oops. Okay, so this is kind of the end of the, that uh, discussion of the quantitative spec reconstruction methods. Um, and I think the, the morals are that if you re re pay careful attention to the modeling the image physics, um, then you can get, it's, it's feasible to get accuracies, at least for organ size objects of, of 10 to 15% for those three that I showed you. Um, and we can also provide information, potentially provide information about the di distribution of daughters. We did that for the thorium and radium. Um, that's something that we're working on more for, um, um, for actin actinium, for example. Um, are, are there questions about that before I move on to the, the next part? Any questions? Oh, I had a uh, quick question. So regarding, uh, I know you're using iterative reconstruction and um, I understand why you would you know, use it over analytic. It's, so it's easier to incorporate um, scatter and other effects. Uh -huh. um, but have you looked at, you know, the, the one of the reasons why people still use uh, analytic reconstruction for phantom imaging is because there's this known problem of smaller sources converge slower with iterations than larger sources. And so I was wondering if you have like looked into that effect and how it might affect your quantification. 
I, I didn't quite, there is an effect with what small sources and yeah, so the small sources can converge uh, slower. Yeah, that, um, large sources, sources. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, certainly the convergence is a, is a problem. One of the things that we we typically use, I didn't I didn't necessarily show that here. Uh, we often use more images, more iterations for the quantitative, uh, you know, the, for the images that we get the quantitative stuff out of than we do. Than, I, than for the pictures. Um, typically, we would use 20 to 50 iterations of, of, of OSCM with uh, 30, you know, 20, I forget, 16 to 30 subsets. So a lot of updates to try to get as much convergence as you can. I think that, you know, the small objects are a problem because we're, just because the resolution of, you know, the, the collimator resolution of these systems for a high energy collimator, maybe, you know, 1.8, two centimeters to two centimeters. Uh, maybe even a little higher than that. And so getting things, getting much useful information for things much smaller than that, I think is, is not, is not going to help. I, I don't, I just don't think the analytic methods, I, I think that compensating for the physics is so much more important than, mm -hmm. than, the, you know, the, the, the benefits of the, of the um, analytic methods that I, I just don't see them, um, you know, apply, applying in this case. The, there are some problems, you know, I, the, there's, there's some biases with low activity um, that I, I didn't talk about, and, uh, um, but that's something that people have looked at with iterative algorithms that, you know, the filter back projections do a better job with. Um, yeah. There are some methods that, that people have proposed to do that. Um, we haven't applied them yet. I th it's something we're instant in, but it's just a, you know, a matter of time. Um, but and do, do you use any kind of regularization in your OECM reconstruction? Yeah, so I think that, the, for just getting quantification inside an object, you really don't want regularization. You know, the, the regularization gives you more partial volume effects. And I mean, regularization is always a trade off of bias for, for reduced variance. We, we have looked at re regularization. I had a student who looked about at regularization for looking at the activity distribution, you know, at the sub, sub organ level. Um, and there, I think there is some role for it. Uh, you know, the, 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 a lot of the non-uniformities you see in the object are because of noise or because of the, you know, the things you studied in PET, the, the um, ringing that you get from the detector response compensation. And I think the, the regularization can help have some role in that. But I think just for the organ quantification, we, we didn't find it to be helpful at all. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so now let me switch to the, to the, uh, other part of the talk, which I wanted to, um, I guess is the commercial part. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop, stop the conference.